How's it going? You guys loving Do Yo Live this year? You guys having fun? <laughs> well, welcome to the Entrepreneur Panel. Um, we have three guests that are going to be sitting on the panel today. I'm going to introduce them in just a second. But this is your opportunity to ask them anything you want to about their business, marketing, um, branding questions. So um, we're going to bring out the first panelist, which is Joe Sylvester. Come on out, Joe. Joe is the owner of High Octane Coffee. Um, it's great coffee if you guys have not had it yet. He's in Boardman and he's got some franchises in Austintown and growing. We also have Marissa Sergi with Redhead Wine. Marissa is a third generation winemaker and she is doing amazing things as well. You can see her wine or buy her wine in Walmart as well as like local markets around town. And then last but certainly not least, we have Dennis Giraldi founder of Do Yo Live, who put all this together for us today. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, Marissa, we're going to start with you, if that's okay. Ladies first. All the time, always, always. Are you good, Marissa? Hello. I think yeah, they're, they're already on, I think. <laughs> I did the same thing. So, Marissa, you're a third generation winemaker, and um, through that process, how has social media changed the way you sell your wine and do everything compared to the other generations before you? How's it impacted your business? Absolutely. I am currently in a very cutthroat industry, the food and beverage industry, and being able to rise as a third generation winemaker where people have been making wine since the day after prohibition in 1933, and they're using a lot of traditional marketing right now. So as someone that I like to um, look up to other brands that are trying to be pushed out of other larger wineries. I take a look at their model, but think what could I do to be more resourceful and innovative? So utilizing social media has been so important because I can use those platforms to communicate directly to my customers. I can answer them immediately and really showcase the story I'm trying to uh, put out there, which is my very own, just talking about my journey through learning winemaking from my family, why I'm passionate about sharing wine with uh, people and educating them about food. It's just really awesome to be able to have those direct conversations instead of just having signage in stores or buying ads in magazines. It's more personal and wine and food is personal, so I'm trying to emphasize those messages through my marketing on social media. That's awesome. So you, you obviously do a great job on social media and you have Redhead Wine, you have your personal brand, like the others that are on the panel. What tip would you have for the people that are in the audience as far as like what's worked best for you? And I know that what's worked best for you may not always work best for somebody else, but what is the one thing that stands apart, whether it's the, the marketing platform or whether it's a functionality within that platform that's really made a difference in that? Definitely the functionality. Um, I use Facebook Live very often, and I can show my audience my direct experience. I'm walking into a store, what's going on, what kind of events are happening this weekend. I'm pretty much bringing everyone at home with me while I'm traveling throughout the state or the country, uh, showcasing the wines. And I think that's been really exciting for not only myself, but my customers. You could feel like you're in the room with me. And I think that's so important in today's society. I agree. Okay, Joe, you're up. Are you ready? No. Absolutely, always ready. <laughs> always ready. So I don't know if you guys know this about Joe, and I don't know if I can share this, but I'm going to share it. Share away. But um, Joe has monster trucks, and I'm probably using the terminology all wrong. So I. Oh no, you're good. You're good. That's, you're, you got it. You got it. Guinness Book of World Records for the longest monster truck jump. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty awesome, if you ask me. So you go from that to selling coffee. Uh, it's not really going from that to selling coffee. It's adding to that, okay. selling coffee and racing and, and monster trucks. And it's because of all that that led me to coffee. Um, see, I never got into drugs or alcohol. You know, I was traveling on the road. I've been all over the world. I've been to every truck stop. I've been to every state. Um, I've been to several countries, including Europe and Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, so I've been places that I don't even know where I'm at. 
I get there, I wake up in the morning, I'm in a hotel, and I'm like, where are, where, where are we at? Oh, you're in Nashville. Oh, cool. Um, yesterday, I was in Cleveland. So it's, it, ca- caffeine played a very big role in my day-to-day activities with performing. Um, this was very impromptu. I wasn't even supposed to speak here. And Dennis came to me and said, hey, we have a spot that opened up. Can you speak? I was like, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, but it's usually, it was, I, it's always been like that for me. I'm always thrown into early morning medias. Um, when I had my own monster truck, uh, before I was a fly-in driver, I was traveling all night long behind the wheel of an 18-wheeler. I'd get to where I was going early in the morning, and they'd be knocking on my door after I went to sleep for an hour. Hey, you ready for 5 a.m. live morning media? Yeah, you guys better have the coffee ready. So one day I just discovered small batch craft coffee, and once I had it, I was, there was no turning back from that. So it kind of became a hobby of mine. While everybody else was hung over from the bar the night before, I was getting up in the morning before the shows, before races, and trying to soot out the little small coffee shops in whatever town that I was in. And I started to educate myself a little bit more about it. And as I started to get a little bit older, my body started to not, not feel as young as it used to. And I'm like, you know what? Racing is a really tough gig to keep making my living for the rest of my life. I'm going to keep doing it until the day it kills me, but I need something that I could build a future on, something more stable, I need a business, and something that I understand and I'm passionate about. And I loved coffee. I loved coffee, but I hated coffee shops. Um, I was like, let me start my own version of a coffee shop. And when I told people I was gonna start a coffee business, people, all my friends and everybody looked at me like, dude, what are you talking about? You're tattooed, a grease on your fingernails, you drive a semi truck, you got a CDL, like, what do you, just, just wait till you see it. I have these ideas in my head of something that's completely unique. And, and as far as I know, nobody else in the world is doing it quite the way we are at High Octane. You, you are doing it really unique. And when I think of coffee shops, not so much now, but before all the coffee shops started par- popping up, I thought of Friends, right? And the big comfy couch and almost like a the library, acoustic music. And yeah, <laughs> someone singing in the back really badly, but um, but you've done a really good job of meshing those brands. I, I assume that was intentional. Yeah, oh yeah, that. absolutely. I'd say it's a head-on collision of motorsports culture and artisan coffee. We have people that come to my coffee shop getting off Harleys, coming in lifted trucks, and you would never normally see these people in a coffee shop, and I'm introducing them to craft coffee. They're like, they don't even know what fresh roasted coffee is or that you even roast coffee. They don't know anything about it. So I'm kind of introducing a craft artisan niche culture to a demographic that would normally never even consider it. The only thing that they think of coffee, they think whatever has been sitting there all day long at the truck stop. So it's it's kind of an exciting process and we do car shows and play loud rock music and we, it's a really upbeat environment, totally 180 degree opposite of what most people are used to when they think of a coffee shop. Right. Is it a little bit harder to break that stereotype of coffee drinkers, of what you're doing? Are you finding that, or you're still getting a good blend of people? We get a pretty decent blend of people. Um, I always like seeing people's first reaction when they come into high octane. Like, they walk in, and they're like, uh, I thought I was going to a coffee shop, not like a biker bar. Um, <laughs> you, know, they, you know, so they walk in, and, and at first, like, wow, like, this, is, this is totally different, you know? And they feel kind of relaxed. They let their hair down. They kind of go into like a, they don't feel pressured. They, they don't, they look at the menu and they may not know the difference between a latte and a macchiato, but they don't have to. Right. They're just here to have a good time and have a good drink. Um, and, that's, and that's what we're all about. Got it. So now we're talking about like breaking the molds on things. We're gonna hop over to Dennis, right? Dennis, you're bringing this conference here in Youngstown, Ohio, which is pretty amazing and awesome. We're only three years old and you've got 300 people and which I think is amazing that you're doing. What was that like trying to start that very first year of doing this, right? And getting that brand, getting people to recognize that Doyo live brand. We know it's Doyo and Doyo and <laughs> D-O-Y-O and all that fun stuff, which we're still working on or you're still working on. But what, what was it like trying to bring this brand across, which is a totally new concept in Youngstown? Because this stuff, you guys, usually happens in bigger cities. And, I, I wish there was a way to like really like everybody you knew in this town how valuable this conference is. And I'm not just trying to pl- plug the conference, but it's so cool to have this right here in Youngstown. And I personally appreciate it. Yeah. I love and I appreciate all the hard work that you do 
to bring this here, but I know it's not easy and it hasn't been easy. So how did you do that? Well, you know, so what's, I think what's interesting about it is, that, and, and I thought about this when we moved from campus to down here, and it was a big goal and dream of mine that we would ultimately have this conference here in our downtown. And what the interesting thing I think is when I consult with a lot of business on, on their marketing strategy, the biggest risk that any business owner typically takes is the day they decide to start that business. And then from there, where does it go? And it starts to come into, well, let's, let's drive revenue, let's eke out a living, let's survive, whatever, whatever those things are. And so even at this stage in the game, the risk that we took in year three is just as big as the risk that we took in year one. And one of the things that I, I use as my compass and everything that I do pretty much is that first day of school feeling. You remember that? Like you wake like the week before, the day before, the night before, you can't sleep, you're somewhat excited. You're not supposed to like school, at least you're not supposed to say that out loud. But then like in the back of your mind, you're like, I really want to go back to school and I got butterflies in my stomach. And that's kind of where I get from a business perspective is that I love that first day of school feeling. Once I'm able to kind of go through my process of, of seeing whether or not it's going to, to work. I think the second thing behind that is, is the risk. So, you know, in marketing, there's a lot of great stories that are out there in this community and people, you know, people doing things. And especially when you come from like the agency business or the consultancy world. And what I, what I recognized right away was that like, uh, this is either going to work or everybody's going to see me fail. I, mean, I didn't think that there was going to be like any middle ground with it. So I was like, you know what, we're just going to, we're going to put it out there and you know, we're going to go for it. Um, and then just believe in the process. And I really believe in content marketing as a strategy to build an audience. Uh, Joe and Marissa are great examples. They've built an audience, they've built a tribe. And then as they've done that, they've got a product that people believe in because of the tribe and the people that they've been able to attract with that. So that's what I look at. You know, it, it's an extraordinary amount of exposure when you say I'm, I don't know if I've ever said this, but you know, we're gonna take a digital marketing strategy and hopefully we're really good at it too so that we can attract people to come to a conference and, and we were able to accomplish that. You did a great job with it. You're still doing a great job of it. So again, thank you. Thank oh, you for thank that. You. Um, so let me you do a lot obviously with the, the content strategy and stuff like that. If somebody here obviously is like maybe starting a business or starting something outside of the box like what you did, yeah. what advice do you have for them? Um, I think that you got to be real, genuine, authentic, and I think that that's winning in this current state of affairs. I mean, look, we've had some great presenters, and there's a lot of people that love this polished marketing idea of polished marketing. And I think that obviously there does need to be polish, but um, I think that what people are afraid to do, what I've noticed, we do a Do You Live marketing show pretty much every Friday. Joe and Marissa, Marissa's been on it a couple of times. Joe set the world record, uh, not just on World Monster Trucks, but we had a marathon two and a half hour <laughs> Facebook Live. Um, I think business owner, what, what we don't recognize is that every one of you right now has the ability to turn the camera on on your phone and be a content creator and go Facebook Live and talk about giving away information about your business. But for whatever reason, they're more comfortable when they sit down with me and, and, and have that same conversation about their business on Facebook Live. So you have to get comfortable with that. I think you have to be able to want to incorporate things into your marketing. And look, we try stuff all the time. Some of it works amazing. And then we have these micro failures like where we'll do a contest and we'll get like one like. And we're like, we're giving away like a $2,500 sponsorship to do you live and we get no response. So, but we're willing to try it. And, and, and if we, you know, we fail and we don't get too hurt in the process, then so be it. Um, yeah. I think you bring up a really good point because I hear a lot from people saying, um, you know, they want like a surefire thing. They don't realize that when you're doing all the things that the three of you are doing and, and several other business owners, that there's a lot of failure that goes in the mix with it, right? So how, and any one of you guys can answer this, when you hit those failures, like what, what do you do? How do you, how do you like pick yourself up from that? I, I have started recently using the analogy of comparing racing to business. Racing exactly like business is you basically live every day in failure because every once in a while you win, 
<laughs> but you got to take into consideration when you show up, I show up to that track on Saturday night, there's 24 other guys that want to win. And they're good. And they're very good at what they do. And they've all perfected their craft to the best of their ability. It's the same way in business. Uh, you may be really good at something, but there's a lot of other people that are really good too. And it's taking the time and keep on pushing through the hard times to keep, just keep pushing on, pushing on, pushing on. And eventually you get that win. And I, I think any win that comes with hard work before it is so much better because you truly appreciate the victory, the win, after you've put in the hard work. If winning was easy, it wouldn't be so great. You know, and, and, it, and it's exactly the same way in business as it is in racing. You're never going to win them all. Uh, you're going to throw a lot of things against the wall in marketing, and only a little bit's going to stick. You're going to try certain things. You're like, this is a great idea. We're giving away all kinds of cool stuff. People are going to love it. And then nobody shows up. Like, okay, maybe we'll try again next week. We'll, we'll fine tune it a little bit. We'll tighten the screws a little bit here, polish this a little bit, change this, and maybe the next time it'll work. So it's about constantly trying new things and, and keep pushing on. And to add on that, I think like just as a young person, I started Redhead when I was 19. I was afraid to fail, but then I read in a book that uh, it's really great to embrace failure and just look at how this moment is trying to teach you something. And if you take that advice and really see what lessons you can learn, it really will define your success later in the future. So I think uh, failure is equally as valuable as successes because you get to appreciate each and every one of those. And I think winning after a few uh, really tough times through your business just feels much better. It's, it's more satisfactory and uh, you get to celebrate with your friends and family. So uh, definitely having that perspective where you don't let failure define you um, is really important. I'm an ultra competitive individual, um, and, and I think people mistake niceness for competitiveness. Um, and then that goes all the way back to my years when I played college basketball. Um, obviously, I'm the prototypical college basketball player, if you've noticed today. <laughs> um, I mean, could, I, I could remember you not coming out of my dorm for like, right? I, yeah. Um, I remember not coming out of my dorm for three days because we lost to our crosstown rival, and that's now a two or three lifetimes ago, and I'm still not over that. Um, so losing losing's a, a bad thing, and unfortunately, it's it's been passed down generational to to my kids. But losing and failure, I I, I think they kind of go hand in hand, and I think that one of the things that was unique about my upbringing, even to the point now where I, I kind of am, I. I, I live with it, embrace it as best as I possibly can. I've learned to handle it better. Is that my my dad particularly was very good at letting me have micro failures along the way to hang myself. Like so, I it was pretty remarkable parenting out of how it happened. But I would I would like get this leash, and I would I, there would be something that would happen. They probably they probably saw it coming, but I never got too beat up in that process. And then there was always a little bit of a punishment following that. But um, I, I, I chalk up, you know, all these things um, um, to trying to learn from those failures. Hopefully they're just not too big along the way. Yeah, I agree with you guys. I'll Do we have any that. questions from our well, that's what I was just studio audience? Uh, I'm not going to hog all the questions, Dennis. Uh, don't don't worry. <laughs> but no, um, does anybody here have a question for any one of them? I'll like run up to you. All right, you'll be next. Let me grab her. And this is Deanna's big Oprah moment. I by feel the like way. I'm Oprah right now. I'm not going to lie. Everybody, <laughs> look under your seat. You can win something. And if you're old as us, it's me. Like, you know, Phil Donahue, who invented the game. Anyway. So, Marissa, having gone to school at Cornell, um, and, you know, that's a fantastic school, of course. Not that YSU isn't fabulous. But, um, do you feel that you learned more about social media and marketing there in the real world or a combination thereof? Great question. So honestly, I'm just a winemaker. I didn't know anything about business. I created a label as my capstone project to graduate. So I didn't learn anything about social media marketing during my undergrad. It was literally just experimentation, um, being fearless and putting myself out there definitely was very nerve-wracking and um, 
scary for me at first. I think my first live video, I was in a Walmart, it's the Youngstown Walmart in Poland. Literally felt like my heart was gonna explode. I was so nervous. I was doing a live video in the middle of a Walmart. I was afraid people were looking at me and judging me. But when you kind of get over that and stop caring, like you just kind of just roll with it, see what happens. And I think it's something that I've really embraced and um, I've seen what works and what doesn't work. So I'm really self-taught with social media and I'm really grateful that I was able to kind of see what was something that was gonna be beneficial for the brand. But um, even you know, YSU and other undergraduate classes throughout Ohio have great classes or you can learn on YouTube or <laughs> you guys are here at Do You Live, um, tons of resources. So definitely um, it's self-taught and then looking at other things. So. And, and I, would, I would second that up with this is that you gotta be a practitioner. Um, every day, I mean, and I, I believe in the consumption part that Alan talked about later or earlier today, but you have to be a practitioner and figure out what's working with you. I personally, I teach part-time at Youngstown State University. I teach social media marketing courses. And, and so a lot of the information, fundamentally, even stuff that Dariana covered, because of how the platforms are so rapidly evolving and changing and the velocity of what they do, Fundamentally, there's a lot of things that are still in place, but the button pushing mechanism or how the feed or some of that is ultimately going to change tomorrow. I mean, it's just the reality of, of where it is. But we do, you know, in my social media classes at Youngstown State, I, I try to not just teach them about platform and usage, but I also try to develop some muscle memory so that they have the students have the ability to consume information and content and the resources that are out there so they develop that habit on a consistent basis. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, I, I love Marissa's approach um, to what she's doing with marketing. And I think, to some people I think overcomplicate things when it comes to social media. Um, what sells is just you being real. You don't have to be polished. You don't have to be perfect in the way you speak. Um, you know, because some people are born with the natural ability to speak to people or be on camera. Some people aren't. That doesn't matter. People appreciate the realistic and they can relate to you. If you stumble over your words, that's fine because somebody else is going to do the same thing. They just, they appreciate the effort you're putting in to reach out and say, hey, here's my product. This is what I do. And that's why I think her live videos do so well is because they're not edited. They're not scripted. She just walks in, turns her phone on live, and people are like, well, there's no faking this. It's, it's totally real. She's not rehearsed anything, and, and she's just shooting off the cuff. So I think, I think uh, there, there's something to be said for, the, for that approach to marketing, for sure. Thank you. So you, you started to answer my question right there. Um, we, we have a challenge working with clients as far as protecting brand safety in social media, especially when it comes to Facebook Live. So if you're running your own business and say, you know, you're in charge of brand safety for your brand, you can s say what you want as, as the business owner. But a lot of times we're working with a structure where there, there's layers of approval and it's really tough to get even a, uh, a short, I'd say less produced video produced and then uploaded and shared. And Facebook Live, it seems to be right out for some of our clients just based, you know, they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing. And it's we, gonna be live if you could maybe it, give some advice. Oh, hey Jim, uh, follow up questions to that. Are, are these highly regulated, the blue blood industries of the world, financial, um, legal, healthcare, or are they, they more the B2C or? What? So we really have a mix. So yeah. yeah, good question. It will depend on the industry, insurance, obviously a lot of things have to go through compliance, but you know, even nonprofits that are very worried about their perception in the community, you know, jumping on Facebook Live is a big risk. It does make a lot of people nervous. But how I many people have a out. regularly thing on Facebook Live that they utilize and leverage into their marketing strategy? Besides me, Marissa <laughs> and Joe. I actually don't do it regularly. I, well, I, I just mean, so, uh, so uh, look, for the past two years, I've been preaching about Facebook Live, and the reason I've been doing that is because if you were marketing a business back on social media in 2007, and I was in healthcare at a time when nobody was touching social media in healthcare, right? They were absolutely afraid of it. 
we were making national trade publications and they were saying that you can't post yourself on a, on a site where college kids are posting themselves at a keg party. Bottom line, right? Completely disruptive. And, and so now you fast forward to 2018, there's not a healthcare organization service provider that's out there today that doesn't have a social media strategy. But the platform has evolved now to the point where in 2007, uh, a hospital in healthcare couldn't be on social media. Now they've come around to 10 years later saying, we obviously have to be on social media to engage with our patients, to engage with people. And Facebook Live's that next layer. And I do see that the opportunity that we have seen, even though that we were early, and I don't think that it's a great idea that we could all walk around like a Kardashian and have our own reality TV show. But the reality is that we can all walk around and have our own reality TV show. And it's getting more crowded. So, you, so what happened in 07 is that businesses went to Facebook and they said, I don't think this is real. And they waited five years and they watched their competitors grow 5,000 followers on Facebook. And then they said, oh, maybe we should take this serious. And then wouldn't it be great if we had 5,000 followers? And Facebook Live feels like that all over again where people are like, ah, I don't know. I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to have a strategy. I'm afraid of this. And they're not building this following on Facebook Live. And in, in a very short amount of time, they've launched Facebook Watch in three years, a year, two years. It's going to be inundated. I mean, there's people in this room right now. I mean, Mandy, you didn't raise your hand, but Mandy does Facebook Lives on a consistent basis, gets thousands of viewers. Well, in two years from now, that's going to be 4,000 views or 5,000 views, and, you're going to be, and people are going to be sitting there going, I really wish I would have did Facebook Live. But, I mean, that's just how it goes. And I know how difficult it is, you know, when you're working with somebody else to try and convince them about what's good for marketing. Um, but to kind of answer your question, of, so do you control some of the marketing, like, for your clients? Is that, okay. Um, okay, so if I were in your position, maybe what I would do, maybe your nonprofit sector, just to have, throw this experiment out there, so you have 10 clients that have nonprofits, suggest that you'll be the first to be innovative and do Facebook Live. I know it's gonna be a risk, but with great risk, there's great reward, and if they're success, which I have no doubt there will be, uh, you could go to your other nine clients and be like, hey, this nonprofit took the risk and look at them. They have more people coming to their events, more awareness about what they're doing. That's what nonprofits want. So you can nearly just offer the suggestion for them and I would have a feeling at least one person may take the leap, maybe a different sector of your clients. And you can use their success as an example to um, have even more success with your suggestions of social media, if that makes sense. All right, cool. Well, this deals with uh, the future. Um, so in your professional uh, opinion, we live in this very competitive, changing space. That we hear it all the time. Things are changing on Facebook. In two years, in five years, can you guys comment on your opinion of what we're going to see in this digital space and possibly just elaborate or, or give us advice as we move forward in the next two to five years? I believe it's going to be all video and podcasts. People want to see and they want to hear. They don't want to read, unfortunately. So really trying to look at your strategy now, get there before your competition, start making YouTube channels, start uploading videos to Facebook Watch and um, showing little snippets of what you're experiencing to group in your audience of what's going on with your brand or company and maybe starting a podcast, really starting those trends now, which uh, Dennis and Joe have spoken about. Uh, you'll be able to grow your audience to the rate you'd want them to. So you're ahead of your competition when your competition realizes that you're moving a million miles an hour and they are way behind. So definitely that's where I see social media going in the next two to five years. But uh, Dennis and Joe, if you have any other thoughts. I, I agree 100%. I mean, you look at what Facebook is doing, what Instagram is doing, and nobody's ever going to topple Facebook and Instagram. Instagram's owned by Facebook. YouTube's owned by Google, correct? So YouTube's very big right now too. I think building a platform on YouTube and Facebook is, is, is definitely a good way to go about doing things and utilizing, like Marissa said, uh, podcasts and videos. Um, that's definitely, definitely the future, for, without a doubt. You know, the, the, the thing that I would look at is to say this, is that if, if you aren't committed to some sort of video strategy on any of the platforms, um, and or a, a paid spend, um, 
you need to strong, I, I think you need to strongly consider what the approach looks like because, I mean, if you just look at, you know, Facebook's the Microsoft of, of social media and whatever Snapchat develops, Facebook's got a thousand, uh, hundred developers that are willing to be able to very nimbly develop the same product and, and keep them from growing. Um, Facebook's organic reach has declined as their stock price has increased. And so, you know, the, I, 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 it's hard for me to fathom that we're still having the conversation um, with marketers and social media marketing about organic reach being dead on Facebook. But the fact of the matter is that it's been dead if not for three or five years. Um, so I, I think that the platforms continue to evolve. The, platform, the differences between the platforms were this at one time. Similar to TV, radio, and newspaper, you delivered that message much differently. TV, obviously visual, radio, I've got the radio face, and then you've got like the newspaper, right? And that message was a lot different. And, and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, those were also different ways to deliver the message. But what's the difference between the platforms now? They all have a streaming video capability, they all have live capability, they all have stories, they all have the ability to take video short and long form, they could all tag people, they all work off of some better than others, obviously off of ha a hashtag strategy, but it was once that you had to post something on Twitter a different way than you posted it on Facebook, that you posted it on Instagram, and, and I, I probably get a lot of debate on this, right? But the platforms have shrunk their differences. So um, I think it comes back to compelling, interesting content, being willing to fundamentally always uh, educate your audience, entertain your audience, educate your audience, and then promote. You know, you know, you know, we, um, so what's interesting is that I probably should have screenshotted uh, my last few weeks and did a presentation. So last Saturday and the previous Saturday, has anybody ever had the Facebook uh, Penn State whiteout? Do you know about this? So put on Youngstown's only digital marketing conference and be subjected to Facebook's whiteout a week before your conference. That'll make you crap your pants. <laughs> Sorry. It's, um, I logged into Facebook on a Saturday, two consecutive Saturdays, and my entire page was white. And apparently, I, so I didn't know what was going on, and I started to Google. And this is a phenomenon with Facebook that from time to time, you get, a, you get nothing but a white page. And eventually it goes away. Sometimes it takes an hour, sometimes it takes a day, sometimes it takes a month. And I was, I was panicked. Um, what Jeff's talking about is that, is that Joe Polizzi in con from Content Marketing World wrote a book called Content Inc. And it's always best that you build up your own database with your content pushing back to, your, to, your, to these different places with your content to your website grow your email list and monetize that from a business. Um, I, I believe in that strategy. You have to own your database because at any one time, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, anything can change at any given time. But I also um, push back on that in the sense that email is the primary way that you're gonna communicate with this strategy. And email is subject to change. Uh, Gmail is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. People can opt out, people can have a spam blocker. And so it's not obviously bulletproof. We changed our strategy to say that we're gonna use Facebook as the genesis of our content, meaning that we're not gonna put a blog out on our website and then distribute it to all the different sites. We actually create the content on Facebook, whatever the subject matter is with a live, because we get that engagement, that awareness from Facebook and then we take that content on Facebook and then we repurpose it back to our website. Embed it, transcribe it, upload it to YouTube, share it out on to LinkedIn. But we're not, we're not necessarily relying on Facebook for that rented land, but it is the genesis behind our strategy. And you have to be very careful, because like I said, my screen on Facebook went white and if it didn't come back on, I, I, mean, I mean, there's other page administrators to Facebook for us, but I don't know what we would have done. Hi. Um, my question is, I believe a lot of people now are using a separate stream of income to boost additional revenue. And Joey, when people do it completely opposite, such as the 
monster truck versus the high octane, do you differentiate them completely or do you feel it beneficial to combine into one? Because I think that um, a lot of people are doing a dual business and I just want the panels. Are you talking about, say, me as the business owner of, of high octane as opposed to me as the, the racer? Like, do you combine the two or do you separate the two? Correct. Uh, combine, absolutely, because people these days, they buy a face and a personality. They want to relate to you. They want to see you. They want to connect with Marissa. They want to connect with me. They don't care about the logo or the name. Um, and I was even the same way when I was in monster trucks because in monster trucks, the way the business works is you, you obviously have a name of your truck. And promoters tend to promote that name way more than whoever's behind the wheel. I always promoted my name right alongside the name of the truck because I was the one that created it. I was the one that drove it. And I wanted my fans to be able to know who I was if I drove a different truck next week or whatever it was. I, and I built my social media around that. Um, so now with High Octane, I make sure that I'm prominent in the brand as well because I've built that following. And if I decided to shut High Octane down tomorrow, I would still have all these people that know me and trust me because of the my, my self brand that I've created over the years. Same with Marissa. People know Marissa Sergi. If she was to decide to completely get, get, do away with her wine company and start a coffee shop tomorrow, people would be like, oh, I know Marissa. I, I'm going to go check her out. So I, I think building your personal brand is every bit as important, if not more important, than building your actual business brand. And, and, and I think that any business that's out there today can, can build that audience and that tribe with their content. Look at, you know, look at HubSpot. Um, they, they've been around since you know, in defining inbound marketing. And inbound, the conference in, in Boston, Mass, has gone from 1,000 to 5,000 to 20,000 people. And they do that by, by delighting their customers with content. Look at Apple. Like, people wait online for a phone. Like, people wait online. Like, talk about first world problems. Like, we wake up in the morning, we're like, oh, the iPhone 10's coming out. I'll go wait online and sleep overnight to get a phone. So, you know, I think brands just as much, individuals can build this brand loyalty and this following, and, and people become fans of that, and they grab onto that, and you can, you can run that business that way. And I think that the businesses in the B2B place have every bit the opportunity to do the same thing as well. Deanna, how are we on time? I think we have five more minutes, so this will probably be the last question. OK, oh, yeah. About great. five minutes. You can... uh, this could be for uh, both Joe and uh, Marissa. So both of you, Joe, I know your, your father uh, owned a construction company growing up. Marissa, you're third generation. So you guys had a front row seat to see business when you were young, and obviously you have a front row seat now. Uh, what do you think has changed uh, the most in acquiring customers or, or running a business? Um, and what is same old, same old? Speed. Um, the digital era, everybody has their phone, right? Everybody's, got, everybody's on their phone, everybody's on social media. Um, back in my grandpa's days, when my grandpa started a construction company in 1956, uh, there was no social media. Some people were lucky to have a phone. But if he did a good job building a house for you, you're going to go and you're going to tell him. And then he's going to go to my grandpa. I have him build a house. He does a good job. You're going to tell your friend. Now you click a button and you hit 10,000 people in a second. So the small, it has basically, social media has taken the entire world and made the world a small town. It's the, it's the small town mentality of marketing, like Joe's general store. You come into my general store and I treat you poorly. You know, you are gonna go and you're gonna tell your friends and your family that don't go see Joe, it, it was, his business is terrible. He, he didn't help me get what I needed the same as you would if I did a good job. Now, all you have to do is hit one button on your phone and everybody knows. So it's every bit as important as it has always been, but in the business landscape now, it has taken, like I said, the entire world and made it into one small little town in, right in your phone. So that's the biggest thing that I think has changed is the speed at which we could communicate 
a yay or a nay of a business. So it's probably even more important because if I did a bad job or I treated you bad, it's going to take a long time for you to tell everybody, you know, and by that time I treated a bunch of people bad. Now everybody's going to know instantly. So it's that much more important, I think, to do a good job. And like you were saying with the Facebook whiteout or whatever it was, I still think there's something, and I know this is a digital marketing conference, but I still think there's something to be said about good old-fashioned values and treating people properly when it comes to business and service. Because one thing that's never, a couple things that are never going to really go away is a phone number and maybe your physical location and your name. So if everything went away tomorrow, all the digital stuff, or your Facebook goes down, people could still pick up the phone and call you, or they could come knock on your door, hey, are you guys still open? Is everything still good? You know, and that comes from building that reputation with your customers and, then, and building the trust that's going to supersede no matter what the platform is that you market on or if it all went away tomorrow, make sure that your name is, is, is still good. Yes, and to trail on that, uh, for me in the wine industry, it's a very tired industry in my opinion. We're a commodity product. Think about cereal. Uh, I know a lot of my friends have been buying the same cereal for years because you like it, it tastes good, and it's easy. But there hasn't been any innovation in the cereal industry that I've seen, and in wine, there really hasn't been much either. And uh, a set aside redhead, think about some of the brands that are taking off in the industry, like 19 Crimes. Usually wine comes in a clear bottle if it's a white or rosé, or an amber bottle if it's a red. But uh, 19 Crimes is using a different type of packaging. The, the bottle is very unique, and they're using um, a story they've created through marketing, but they brought it to life. So you can still have that connectivity. Uh, if you guys have seen the 19 Crimes app, or it's augmented reality, and you can scan it, they can tell you their story. Uh, they're doing a little bit more of an innovative way of marketing, but for us, in the industry to really stand out, it's more about risk taking. So, uh, with Redhead, just um, you know, the social media strategy that I have, being out online and um, putting the real story out there with direct communication through video and live video and podcasts, been really helpful. But you know, just do that guerrilla marketing stuff, not only online but in person, doing pop up events and uh, really uh, doing things that my competition aren't. So, if you're running a business, which I assume at least. 75% of you are, think about something crazy that may not have happened in your industry ever and be the first one to try it. It might be a flop or it could be an astronomical win and could really create some amazing organic buzz for your brand. So it's really about the, the speed, like Joe has spoken about, but that risk-taking mentality in an industry that hasn't really had innovation go on in it. So. Awesome, thank you guys. I just wanna say thank you, Joe, Marissa. Of course you, Dennis. Yeah, and thank you, Joe, for stepping in and pinch hitting on such short notice. But you did message me, not to mountain bike, but a about a month ago, you said, if you need anything, let me know. So that's why I tapped you. No problem you at all. You did a great I'm, job. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to help out, and hopefully everybody takes something away from this. I know I am. I came here just to, to learn. I don't think anybody has perfected marketing or especially social media, nor do I think anybody ever will because it's constantly evolving. So it's networking with everybody else and getting different opinions from people and applying it to what you do. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate both of you doing this. I think we're going to do some closing remarks and, and, and uh, then have some fun, right? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.